Dr. Omende. So let's continue with our series on meninges and uh, CSF. So what is cerebrospinal fluid? It's a clear um, colorless fluid that usually uh, produced by the cortexes. So um, it's found in the ventricles of the brain and the subarachnoid space. Remember, this is between the arachnoid and pia mater. And it, this subarachnoid space surrounds both the brain and the spinal cord. So you need to keep the pressure of CSF constant at all times. So CSF is found within the ventricle and the subarachnoid space, and it's supposed to be kept at a constant pressure. So it's usually clear and colorless, approximately 130 to 150 mils, produces 0 0.5 mils per minute with a pressure of 60 to 150 millimeters of water. So it contains protein, glucose, chlorides, and a number of cells. And this um, is actually the normal, these are the normal ranges of what is expected. So these parameters are very important because during, for example, infection, meningitis, you are able to take the CSF and examine for uh, any elevation or decline in these parameters, then you'll know there's a problem for diagnostic purposes. So what are the functions of cerebrospinal fluid? It helps to cushion and protect the central nervous system, that's brain and spinal cord, from trauma. It also provides mechanical buoyancy. So the brain is able to float within the CSF, therefore the weight will be reduced. And also CSF supports the brain. It serves as a reservoir okay and helps to regulate the contents of the skull it nourishes um, the cns so it contains factors that will help to nourish the cns and then it helps to remove the metabolites from the cns and csf also helps with the integration of brain and endocrine functions whereby some hormone releasing factors from the hypothalamus are actually secreted directly into the csf the CSF also influences the microenvironment through which the neurons and the glial cells are able to, to function. So what forms CSF? Mainly it's an ultrafiltrate from plasma, blood plasma, ultrafiltrate from blood plasma, and it's a secretory product that um, um, is produced in, uh, by active transport mechanism, which are usually controlled by enzymatic processes. So majority of CSF is actually from choroid plexus, choroid plexus in the ventricles. Remember, choroid plexus is just formed by the epithelial cells of the pia mater lying on the basement membrane and epithelial cells of capillaries lying on basement membrane. So these two basement membrane are adjacent to each other. So this epithelium is what forms the um, choroid plexus. So 70% of CSF is by this choroid plexus. Then 12% um, is from metabolic water production that's based on complete oxidation of glucose, while 18% of CSF is just capillary ultrafiltrate by extracoroidal sources. So CSF is mainly formed by choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle, mainly the um, anterior and inferior horns of the lateral ventricles. And these are located on the um, floor or the lateral ventricle, and then the Third ventricle also, a bit of it, the, of the choroid plexus are on the roof of the third ventricle. Then we also have epidermal cells that line the ventricles, help to produce CSF. And some CSF comes from brain substances through the perivascular species, the spaces around the blood vessels. So how is what ensures that CSF is flowing or rather the movement of CSF inside the ventricles? Number one, this movement is controlled by pulsation of the arteries, okay? Remember, the, the subarachnoid space contains arteries. So as the arteries pulsate, the CSF is able to flow. Then we also have cilia and microvilli of the epidermal cells. These aid the propulsion of CSF. And then lastly, we have the hydrostatic pressure of um, CSF, which is at 15 millimeters of water, that also ensures that CSF is in circulation. So what's blood CSF barrier and what evidence is there for its existence? Now, we have concentration of substances in the CSF, which are usually independent of how these substances are concentrated in the plasma. So for example, CSF has higher sodium, chloride, and magnesium compared to plasma, and lower potassium, calcium, glucose, and protein compared to the levels in plasma. So when you, for, uh, for instance, inject protein traces through the blood vessels, 
as it circulates, they may stain the choroid plexus. Only stain the choroid plexus, but will not enter the CSF. Proteins and hexoses, other than glucose, usually do not enter the CSF from blood. So that way, you're able to actually prove that this blood CSF barrier exists. It's a barrier that prevents substances from blood from entering into the CSF. Okay. Then, what are the components of blood CSF barrier? You have tight junction that is formed between the apical regions of the cuboidal epithelial cells near the surface of the choroid plexus. Okay, so you have cuboidal epithelial cells near the surface of the choroid plexus. They form very tight junction in between the epithelial cells, these cuboidal epithelial cells. Therefore, this forms a barrier that prevents substances that have been injected in blood from entering the CSF. So what's the function of this blood CSF barrier? You're able to restrict substances within the blood from entering the CSF. That way, you've prevented them from reaching the brain or the spinal cord, okay? Then we have blood-brain barrier. Blood-brain barrier protects the brain cells from harmful substances and pathogens. So it's a barrier that protects the brain from harmful substances and pathogens that are within the blood. So it prevents the passage of substances from blood into the brain tissue. Blood-brain barrier does not prevent all substances from getting through. For example, oxygen will pass through, carbon dioxide will pass, some anesthetic agents, alcohol, those ones pass the blood-brain barrier. So it's not a barrier for everything. It's a selective barrier. It, it allows some things and prevents others. What are the components of blood-brain barrier? So you have capillary endothelial cells lying on their basement membrane. And these endothelial cells have tight junctions between them. Then we have food processes of astrocytes. Okay, so the basement membrane of these astrocytes and these capillary endothelial cells, all they fuse together to form one basement membrane. So all these three are the components of blood-brain barrier. So capillary endothelial cells lying on a basement membrane and the tight junction between these capillary endothelial cells. Then the interdigitation of the food processes of astrocytes. So those are the components of the blood-brain barrier. So as you can see, this is your capillary. The endothelial cells have tight junction between them and they're lying on a basement membrane, this blue, okay? And these are the food processes of astrocyte. This is an astrocyte. Astrocyte, these are the food processes that are interdigitated. So the interdigitation of the food processes of astrocyte, the basement membrane of capillary endothelial cells, and the capillary endothelial cells and the tight junction between them, these form the blood-brain barrier, which prevents toxic substances from the blood from entering the brain tissue. Then we go to formation of CSF and flow. So CSF is formed mainly by the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle. From lateral ventricle, CSF gets to third ventricle through interventricular foramen of Monroe, from third to fourth ventricle through cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius, which is at the midbrain. From fourth ventricle, the CSF can live through three ways, two lateral foramen of Lushka, laterally, or one foramen of Majendi, which is a median foramen of Majendi, okay? And that way, CSF will now go into the subarachnoid space. But CSF can also continue um, inferiorly into the central canal of the spinal cord. So if it goes to the subarachnoid space, it goes to circulate on the superior portion of the brain. And if it goes inferiorly, it enters into the central canal of the spinal cord. Then the one that goes superiorly will be reabsorbed at the arachnoid granulations, the superior sagittal sinuses. So I'll do that again. CSF is produced mainly at choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle, from lateral to third ventricle through interventricular foramen of Monroe, third to fourth through cerebral aqueduct, fourth it will exit through two lateral foramen of Lushka and one median foramen of Majendi. Then into subarachnoid space will be reabsorbed at the superior sagittal sinus at the arachnoid granulation, but it can continue inferiorly into subarachnoid space of the spinal cord and also central canal of the spinal cord. Absorption of CSF into dural venous sinuses. Remember from the subarachnoid space, you have arachnoid granulations, and these arachnoid villi granulations project into the superior sagittal sinus. So the CSF pressure, this pressure here, is higher than the pressure in the venous sinus to allow flow in one direction. So the arachnoid, they serve as one-way valve, one way. So you can only flow from CSF to the venous sinus. If CSF pressure 
is higher than venous pressure. The valves will now open and CSF will enter the dural sinus. Okay. And if the venous pressure is high, if in any case this pressure is higher than this, the valves will close. So they will not allow blood to enter the CSF. So they are one-way valves. If pressure here is higher, the valves open and empty CSF here. But if pressure here is higher, the valves close. Therefore, they don't allow blood to enter into the subarachnoid space. So again, from lateral ventricle through Monroe to the third, from third, cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius to fourth, from fourth, the two lateral of Lushka and one median of aperture of Magendi, then down into the central canal of the spinal cord. So that's basically the, the flow. And then reabsorption of the arachnoid granulations into the superior sagittal sinuses. Again, you need to appreciate that we also have other species we call the cisterns that are not part of the ventricular system, but they are pockets of CSF. So you have chiasmatic cistern here. Pockets of CSF around the optic chiasma, interpedancular cistern, pocket of CSF around the interpedancular foramen, uh, fossa, interpedancular fossa, pontine cistern anterior to the pons, cerebellar medullary cistern between the junction between the cerebellar and the, the, the medulla, and you have a superior cistern here between the, um, the cerebrum and the cerebellum at this portion. So these are just pockets of CSF that are not part of the ventricular system, but they contain CSF within the subarachnoid space. So what's the clinical application of uh, CSF flow? We have hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is when you have excessive accumulation of CSF. You can see how this head is enlarged. So there's hydrocephalus in this child. We have two types of hydrocephalus, communicating and non-communicating. Communicating means all the ventricles will be communicating. So there's no obstruction in the ventricles. So it's non-obstructive, no obstruction from um, lateral to fourth ventricle. So communicating hydrocephalus is also called non-obstructive. Non-communicating means there's an obstruction somewhere, so all the four ventricles are not communicating. So there's an obstruction. So non-communicating hydrocephalus is also called obstructive. So what causes communicating hydrocephalus? All the four are communicating. So it means that the problem is at the absorption level. So CSF is not being absorbed. Okay, so communicating without obstruction of CSF absorption, but you can also have communicating with obstruction of CSF. So normal pressure hydrocephalus, there is no... In the flow from lateral to fourth to absorption, there's no problem. There's a good communication, but the problem is of a production of CSF. Then we have communicating hydrocephalus where all the four ventricles are communicating. The lateral third and the fourth, they are all communicating, but there's obstruction at absorption level. What can cause this obstruction? It could be infection at the arachnoid granulation or it could be tumor at the arachnoid granulation. Okay, then non communicating, the ventricles are not communicating. So there could be obstruction in the ventricular system. It could be at Monroe or aqueduct of Sylvius. So those are the different types of hydrocephalus. Communicating where there is overproduction of CSF or communicating where all ventricles are communicating but the problem is at the absorption level, infection of the arachnoid granulation or cancer that has spread to that area. Then the non communicating all the ventricles are not communicating so there could be obstruction at the monroe so lateral is not communicating with the third or obstruction at aqueduct or sylvia where third ventricle is not communicating with the fourth ventricle thank you